Let's talk about the lasso a little bit. So uh, before we talked a little bit about convex optimization and what to do if your objective, for example, is non-differentiable, but it happens to be convex, right? So we define things like the subdifferential and subgradients, which exist within the subdifferential, and how to know that you're minimizing a convex optimization based on the subdifferential. Now, this is by no means a complete picture of um, convex optimization and you know, optimizing non-smooth functions or functions with uh, discontinuous derivatives. Um, there's, there's just so much more. I would recommend that you read the Boyd and Vandenberg book for convex optimization. But even that is going to give us a very incomplete picture of optimization as a whole. This is by no means meant to be a um, a complete picture of optimization as it relates to machine learning, but just gives you the basics, which uh, we talked a little bit about fixed point theorems for uh, gradient descent um, and sub subgradient descent. The basic idea there is that um, when you're doing gradient descent, a uh, fixed point is a place where that gradient uh, is equal to zero. And same with the subgradient descent, it's a place where your subgradient is equal to zero as a fixed point. Um, and it turns out that that uh, ends up being the global optimizer for convex optima uh, is a global optimizer for for convex optimization, and so and that's by this first uh, the first order um, property for convex functions. And so th this is all sort of saying that these are nice things to have for gradient descent and subgradient descent, and we're going to. Um, base a lot of our methods, our first order methods that we're, that we're going to use in this class on that. Now the lasso is an example of a convex program which uh, is not smooth, um, so it has a discontinuous derivative, so we have to talk about subgradients to consider optimizing it. Um, for the most part, we're going to motivate it from a more, um, uh, based on its, it as a modification to ordinary least squares, we're going to motivate it as a solution to the subset selection problem. And so that's why we um, think of the lasso as uh, from, from this more, um, j just based on what it, what it can do for us, um, uh, for, for its statistical properties. So we'll, uh, we'll go through that today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about its optimization and the different methods for optimizing it and finding the lasso solution. And uh, if, you, if you want to uh, read something in advance, you should go through the Elements of Statistical Learning, Chapter 3. Okay, so let's recall convex optimization. So let's just go back through uh, a couple of the basic, basic definitions here. So if um, f is a function, it's convex if f at some uh, some average, effectively, some convex combination between x not and x1. If that's uh, it's convex, if that's bounded by the uh, same convex combination of f of x not and f of x1. Right. So, um, so it's just the function is below its um, its uh, uh, the secant lines. So uh, we can recall the first order condition, which is really saying that the function lies above its tangent lines. Um, so these, these two things are equivalent, that the function lies below the interior of its secant lines, and the function lies above the uh, tangent lines. Um, so the first order condition just says if you do your first order expansion, the first order approximation of the function at some x naught, then that's going to necessarily lower bound your f. So that, that's another property of, of convexity, but to be able to state something like this, you need differentiability, which we're not going to assume in general. So uh, inspired by that, we're going to define something that generalizes the gradient. Um, we call it a subgradient. And this is defined for any convex function, not just differentiable ones. And it's just any vector that satisfies the, um, this uh, zero, th uh, the first order condition for um, for convex functions. So for a global optima, turns out that zero uh, lies within the subdifferential, which is the set of all such sub subgradients for the global optima, and that's an if and only a statement. Okay, so we apply this to wavelet denoising. 
So we uh, started off by saying we have some vector, which is like a time series, y1 to yt. And then we wanted to reconstruct y. We wanted to denoise it, but we want to do it uh, via some basis. So w is a, is a basis matrix. Um, and w uh, uh, multiplied by beta, beta is a, is a vector, a t vector. Um, we're assuming that we're going to reconstruct y with w times beta. And uh, beta, we're going to assume, has some small sum of the absolute values, of its absolute values. And we showed that this actually can be solved via um, soft thresholding. So let's look at what that means a little bit. So w in this context was t by t. w transpose was the identity. Same with w transpose w. Um, so this is orthonormal, and it has full rank design. So this, this second condition here, w transpose w being the identity, that's what we usually mean by orthonormal. But because it's full rank, it's also going to be the case that this ww transpose is the identity. Then we want to minimize the following thing, which is just a sum of squares error, y minus w times beta, the ith component squared, summing that. Then multiply it by 1 half to make our lives a little bit easier, um, plus lambda times the sum of the absolute values of the betas. So that, that's our goal, is to minimize this. Um, and if we just plot the first four components of W, then we get, or the first three components of W, sorry, we get one, which is, it's hard to see, this blue curve is just constant. That's called the father wavelet. It's the one that, um, it, it just, you can think of it like an intercept. And then um, we have another, which is the first mother, which is the mother wavelet, that's what we call this, but another which is positive and constant for the first half and negative and constant for the second half. And so you can think of, if you were to apply this second wavelet function, take it to inter the inner product of that with y, um, then that's going to give you the, uh, the sum or weighted sum of all of the first half minus uh, the same sum of the second half. So it's sort of looking at the difference, how much uh, y differs between the first half and the second half. That's, that's what that co coefficient is going to correspond to. And then the next coefficient is going to be the first one-fourth minus the second one-fourth. And then this, the rest gets zeroed out. So that's the idea behind the wavelet coefficient, is each coefficient corresponds to some difference between adjacent segments. And these are dyadic in, this, um, uh, in the sense that you can see that this is the first one fourth, the second one fourth, then you would have the first one eighth, the second one eighth, or the third one eighth and the fourth one eighth. Those are these dyadic intervals. Okay, so it turns out that this basis that we constructed here is orthonormal and of full rank. So that's nice. Um, and this is the original data. Um, so what we want to do is denoise it so we would be able to say that, oh, it's quite large in this in this early region, the volatility. Our original signal was volatility of stocks. So it's quite large in these first first sections. So we'd like to preserve the values. So the wavelet coefficients will probably some of the wavelet coefficients corresponding to this first region that are supported over this first region are going to be non-zero. And then we have this spike here in volatility. So maybe we would have that the wavelet coefficients here are going to be non-zero. So this is an example of um, a reconstruction, and this is with a relatively large lambda. This is the largest lambda that we had considered, and what it does is it creates these large constant, or one of the largest lambdas, not the largest, but one of the largest lambdas, um, and it creates these long constant regions uh, in the, the reconstruction of the volatility. And the way that we can interpret that is that there is no really um, small wavelets the wavelets with small support that are have a non-zero coefficient within this region. Right? So some of these wavelets have these small support and are very spiky. Some of them are long, uh, have a long domain and are uh, more flat. And for those which are long in this region, uh, maybe there's one of them that has a non-zero coefficient. Right? It looks like it has a change point right here and right here. So that's um, that's the idea behind how this is doing this reconstruction for these, for these wavelets. Okay. 
So if we look at this, if we look at um, what the betas actually are, so this TSE soft was actually the betas after it's been soft thresholded. So we know what soft thresholding does. It sends some of the some of the y, uh, some of the um, observations to zero. So we had applied W transpose times Y and then done soft thresholding on that to get our beta hats. Right? And so that W transpose Y, if we just think that's a vector, that's a T vector, um, and it's soft thresholding that. So some of those components which are small are getting sent to zero. And so if we look at this, this is the result after soft thresholding. This is a um, so the zeroth coefficient, there's a spike there, and then maybe one of the early coefficients, there's another spike. Then there's spikes in various places, and those are probably the ones that correspond to these, uh, these spikes here. And then also definitely this spike here is, um, is this spike that we're seeing at this moment. So, um, so these betas correspond to the different wavelets. And then when we do our reconstruction, we're just summing each wavelet times the beta. So we can see that if you imagine that there's a beta that corresponds to, it's about the 350th um, wavelet, that 350th wavelet might be a, um, a peak here, have a peak here, and then a large negative component here. Right? And then because the beta is non-zero in that case, then we have a... Um, we have a spike there. And we're only looking at um, the fourth coefficient. So this is the, the coefficient corresponding to the fourth index. Um, so that's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's this uh, FITC, right? And so you have, it looks like there's maybe two wavelets that are being used to construct this FITC, um, de this denoise version. OK. And we can look at, um, for example, the different wavelet coefficients times their corresponding betas. And so we had a few of them that were non-zero. Um, and particularly, we had one that was this long um, wavelet. There's this long um, wavelet here, which has a non-zero coefficient. And then we have uh, these, these short little wavelets in here that have non-zero coefficients. And then when we sum it all up, that's this red curve here, we get a long uh, constant region here, and then we get these short spikes. And those correspond to the uh, non-zero wavelet coefficients that are in the middle and, and, um, and toward the beginning. So these correspond to these beta, the beta here and the betas here that are non-zero. Okay. So, um, so that required, for all of this to work out, that required orthogonal design. Because we had orthogonal design, we were able to re-express this sum of square error as a square error between W transpose Y and beta, minus beta, just beta. And so it effectively had identity design in that case. And that made our lives a lot easier. We were able to show that soft thresholding was the minimizer for that case. But in the case that this design is not orthogonal, is, um, is just arbitrary design, the solution to this is much more difficult to find. It doesn't have a close form like soft thresholding. So for that purpose, we would need an algorithm. So why would we want to do this? Um, so this is, this is what's known as the lasso. And for the same reason why we would want to do it before, because we want to reconstruct betas where a lot of them are sent to zero. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and we'll give examples for why we would do the lasso in a little bit. Um, the objective here is still, um, if, if we have a Gaussian noise model, homoscedastic Gaussian noise model, then this is still the um, negative, proportionate to the negative log likelihood. Well, we have this L1 penalty again. So a couple of things about this. Just like before, this is convex. Um, it's non-smooth, um, and so, Recall that these absolute values are not are not smooth. They have a discontinuous derivative. Um, and it has a tuning parameter lambda. So just like Kainer's neighbors has a tuning parameter, this has a tuning parameter. And we can compare it to this best subset selection. So we proposed best subset, select, subset selection back, I think it was lecture three, um, where we want to find the ordinary least squares uh, minimizer, so the least squares minimizer, subject to the support constraint. One way we could do it is try every single possible support. 
So the support says, which are the non, non-zero coefficients of beta? Right? So we try every possible combination of, of uh, dimensions of beta. So if P is, say, um, so if the number of variables, the predictor variables is, say, 10, and S is 5, then that would be 10 choose 5 different combinations. Each of them we would solve the ordinary least squares, and then we would see uh, what the resulting beta is. Um, of course, 10 choose 5 is huge, and that's why this ends up being an NP-hard problem. Um, it can be proved that this, this is an NP-hard problem. And so we don't like to solve this problem. We gave some greedy heuristics for it, like forward stepwise um, solution. But this, um, but this program is convex. And um, we know that we can solve most convex problems. So why, um, why do we end up tending to send things to zero, some of these betas to zero? Because that's not obvious when we talk about non-orthogonal design. It turned out to be the case when we had ortho orthonormal design with full rank because the solution was soft thresholding. And we know that some of them get sent to zero. But in what situations does this happen? Um, uh, for for the lasso. And this is one of the properties that we want because we want to be able to find betas that have a uh, support that's smaller than all of the variables. We want to be doing subset selection. So we want the beta hat that results from this to have a lot of zeros or to have um, zeros that are sufficient for our purposes and we can tune lambda to get that number of zeros. Right? Um, so why, why does this happen? Well, if we think about the objective, let's think about the level sets of the, of the objective. The objective is the two norm between y minus x beta. So if we think about what this means as a function of beta, this is beta just depicted in two dimensions. Right? So two-dimensional beta here. Um, it's zero if we can get, um, it, it's, a, it's a minimum at the ordinary least squares solution. Right? The ordinary least squares minimizes this uh, L2 norm. It's not zero, but it's, sm it's the smallest it can be. Right? So that's this point right here, is the ordinary least square solution. Now, as you move away from the ordinary least square solution, your objective here is going to increase. Right? So we're going to be trading off this objective, this two norm, with something else. Now, the uh, level sets are ellipsoids. These are ellipses in two dimensions. Sorry, this drawing is a little bit imperfect, but it's, uh, it's good enough for our purposes. The level sets of this are ellipsoids, right? So, and how do we know that? Well, this is a quadratic equation. This, uh, this, is, this is what a level set means. So as we increase this gamma here, we're going to get further and further away from this. But by further, we don't mean in Euclidean norm. We mean in this, in this norm, which is called the Mahalanobis norm, right? Or, um, and so, so what we want to do if we think of the constrained version of the problem, where the L1 norm is constrained instead of being regularized, so we're trying to balance these two terms. So let's just set this equal to some number and this equal to some number, and let's move those numbers until, so this is gamma, set this equal to gamma and this equal to something else, the penalty. Um, and let's move those numbers until uh, these are balancing each other out. Right? So as we increase gamma, um, we're going to get further and further away from the ordinary least squares solution. Now the penalty, what are the level sets of the penalty? Well, these are these diamond-like regions. Right? And so, right, because the, if you think about the L1 norm, that's the sum of the uh, ab absolute values of the two components of beta here. Right? And so those uh, have these vertices here. If you, if you say that, let's just set it equal to one, then you could set beta zero equal to one, you could set beta one equal to one, um, and you could do some convex combination in between. That's how you get these lines. Okay. So this is beta zero, uh, beta zero equal to um, zero, and beta one equal to one. This is beta zero equal to one, beta one equal to zero. And you get the line in between, and then you could set it equal to one, minus one, minus one, minus one, and so on or sorry, uh, you could set it to zero and minus one here, or uh, minus one and zero here, and you could get every line in between. So that's the level sets of the, the one norm. Looks like these diamonds. 
And so when do these two things tend to meet? Well, in many circumstances, you're going to have to have them meet at one of these vertices. So these vertices are sort of special in the sense that there's a lot of different scenarios in which we can imagine these two uh, level sets meeting at one of these vertices. Whereas any point in, on this line, it's a little more difficult to get it so that this thing can meet. It's not impossible. You could have that these level sets touch um, right along this line. And that's a, those are situations in which you're not going to get exactly sparse coefficients. So sparsity, we mean that the beta it, um, has a lot of zeros. Let's compare it to best subset selection. So suppose that I say that the zero norm has to be bounded by one. Then the zero norm could be zero. And that's just the origin, right? The zero norm is uh, the number of non-zero coefficients. And so if being zero says that all the coefficients are zero, that's just the origin here, right? So there's no other options than, than, than just the origin. If we say that the zero norm has to, be, has to be one, then that says that you're either on this axis or you're on this axis because you can't have that both coefficients are non-zero. And so if you're saying that we're going to allow either this axis or this axis to be non-zero, then that means that um, we're going to move along this axis until we're closest to the OLA solution in this norm. So we're going to move up till about here. For this axis, we would move over until somewhere over here. Um, but of course, like we said before, you can't solve best subset selection in polynomial time when you increase this s um, in polynomial time in, in, in s, which is the size of the active set. So we resort to this convex solution. Now, um, back to the lasso, these vertices, which are the points at which these, these two level sets are going to tend to meet, these vertices are sparse. They're along these, this act, it's along this axis. And so that's why you're going to get, um, you're going to tend to get sparse solutions for the lasso. Okay, so um, the lasso can be written in its regularized form or in its constrained form. Um, so that's, you either minimize, um, and there, there's a lot of different options here, but they just introduce different tuning parameters, which you're going to have to tune the parameters anyway and you're, you're typically not given the parameters um, by some oracle. And so uh, the lasso, it can be written in this regularized form in the statistics community in R. This is what you tend to see. You see a lambda parameter. It's uh, times this L1 norm, the sum of the absolute values of beta, plus your uh, data-driven objective here. Or it could be in the constrained form where you minimize this, uh, this sum of square error subject to the one norm being bounded. Okay, so it turns out that for every lambda, there is a C such that the regularized form and the constrained form have the same argument. Um, so you can just imagine moving this C until you get the same, the same thing. But the correspondence between this lambda and C is dependent on your data. And this is, this is a, something that trips a lot of students up is that you know, they think that maybe there's going to be some really nice correspondence between lambda and C in this case, but that correspondence is not something like lambda is equal to one over C. That correspondence is, um, is really driven by the X and the Y here. Um, and so you won't know what this, you, you won't know what the C that gives you the same solution as a given lambda is until you try them all and then see what the solutions are and if they're the same. So really we're thinking, um, the way you should think about it is the lasso, we might be using the regularized form, we might be using the constrained form, but if you're in the regularized form for the lasso, um, then you're tuning lambda. If you're in the constrained form, you're tuning C, and for the most part, they're going to give you the same solutions. It's just not exactly clear how easy it is to tune both of these relative to one another. So it might be easier to tune lambda, it might be easier to tune C, depends on the context probably, depends on the data might be easier to think about the constrained form, so interpretations uh, of these tuning parameters is very different. Um, so there's specific reasons why you would use one form over another. You might, based on the optimization tools you have at your disposal and the design matrix that you're working with, it might be easier to think about the constrained form than the regularized form. So I'm not going to weigh in on whether you should use one or the other. 
but um, but it, for the most part, um, you want to use whichever is more convenient for your purposes, and then know that you're going to have to tune these parameters regardless. So this leads us to an exercise. Um, so it turns out that the lasso can be solved as a quadratic program if we're talking about the constrained form. So let's look back at the lasso in the constrained form. You have this L1 penalty. It's the sum of these absolute values. So on the face of it, this, this is neither linear nor quadratic. On the, this, is, this might be quadratic here. A quadratic program is a, a specific type of convex optimization that takes the following form. You have a quadratic objective where this Q is a matrix is positive semi-definite. You can look back at the definition of positive semi-definite. Basically, no matter what this beta is, this has to be non-negative. This, this quadratic form here has to be non-negative. That's what positive semi-definite means. So, um, so you have to show that this, this part is quadratic, which means that this Q is positive semi-definite and this part is linear. So it can be written in this form. So you have to find what this Q and this A is. And then there's some matrix capital A and some vector little c, such that you can also write the constraint as a linear function. Right? And so don't be fooled. This beta could change. This doesn't have to be the same beta as what we had before. And that's where the trick is going to be. You're going to have to do some uh, variable substitution to solve this problem for beta. Um, and particularly, you're, it's going to take a little bit of effort and thinking to turn your, um, your L1 uh, constraint into a linear form like this. Um, and so your goal is to show that the lasso in its constraint form is a QP. And I'll give you a hint. Um, so you can always take a vector, call it beta, and decompose it into its positive and negative parts. So the positive part is just beta j, the j component of the positive part, is just beta j if it's positive. And if it's negative, then it's minus beta j if it's negative. Right? Um, and you can always write a beta in this form. So just think about re-expressing your original optimization, the lasso in its constrained form, in terms of this beta positive and beta negative, and then try to write out um, your whole um, optimization in this form. It can be a bit tricky, but give it a try. <laughs>